We're going to break bread thinking about 2 Corinthians chapter 4 today. And there are some beautiful words here which are so relevant really to our, our breaking of bread. We have this treasure, verse 7, in earthly vessels, that the exceeding greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. For verse 11, verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Absolutely relevant to what we have to, what, what, what we're here to remember in, in the bread and wine. The Lord's death, his body, his, his life that is manifested in us even now. His death, his life, his resurrection becomes ours. So let's pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, that we come to you pulling aside from whatever's going on in our lives to focus upon your Son and to focus upon his life, his death, his resurrection and his body. And we wish, Father, to demonstrate in taking this bread and wine that we fully, with our whole heart, identify with him, that we are in him and for him. We pray, Father, that you will open our eyes to the wonderful truths that we read here, that all that we're going through now is temporal, is but a light affliction for a moment, that is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Open our eyes, Father, please, to see this more clearly, that all that we are passing through is but for a moment, in the context of that eternal life that your dear Son opened up for us in his death and in his life, in his living again. Help us, Father, that we might remember him, and that we might perceive more finely that this is true for me. And we pray, Father, for all your children, wherever they are, distracted by whatever is going on in their lives. As it was with Paul in this context, the endless criticism and niggling of his relationships with others who were believers and persecution from the world around him. We pray, Father, that all of us going through these things, all of us facing death itself, might realize that this is but a light affliction for the moment, and that we are related to far more exceeding and eternal things in your Son. And we ask this, that you will really answer this prayer for his sake, for the sake of all that he was and is and ever shall be. Amen. So, Paul is dealing with the Corinthians, and it's a very difficult relationship. I mean, they weren't very spiritual people, and they were throwing all kinds of niggling, stupid, irritating criticisms at him. And, you know, we all live under criticism, under a spirit of criticism from other people, and we don't like it. It may be domestically, maybe you have a partner or a child or a parent with whom you live who is always niggling you should have done this, you shouldn't have done that, niggle, niggle, you're not right, you're not the real deal, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Right. And we live in a society in the world that puts you down all the time. This is how it is. And Paul was in this situation. On every side, he, he was getting beat up, as it were. And his answer in these chapters is wonderful, that he's saying, look, <laughs> so it is, so you say about me. Okay, fine. Look, there are far more weighty and eternal things that we are related to. And he's lifting his own mind above all that stuff going on in his life, just like you and me. Well, I'm going to look at some of the phrases here that he uses and some fantastic uh, gems here in what he says in this chapter. But I want to suggest that we read them in the light of the Roman triumph, which he alludes to specifically in chapter 2. And I'll read chapter 2, verse 14. But thanks be to God, who always, always leads us in triumph in Christ and makes manifest through us the savour of his knowledge in every place. For some we are a sweet savour, and to others we are the savour of death, from death to death. So the idea is that the Roman generals won some great uh, 
campaign and then in the in the city there was this triumph and in this case the great victory is that which we commemorate here in bread and wine the victory of the lord jesus on the cross and we are led he says in the triumph well in the triumphant procession there were the captives who had been taken and they were led in humiliation in this procession and at the end of it they were killed at the end of it and they had to carry incense in their hands some of them had incense some of them had their own uh, valuable things and treasures which was effectively the loot the booty that had been taken from them by their conquerors they had to carry all this in their hands and they burn incense to the gods who had conquered them well, you can see how he picks this up and applies it to us, that we are the captives. We were formerly enemies, as he says in Romans and elsewhere, who were conquered by the Lord Jesus, that we were outgunned, outclassed, defeated, and we surrendered. And we are laid as the ashamed captives, in one sense, with the incense, not to the gods, but to the one true God. And that, he's saying, is our witness to men and women. That the smell of the incense we burn is our witness. To some people, it's from death to death. They don't like it. For other people, it is to eternal life. And yet, in another sense, we are not the captives. We are the conquerors because... Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are the conquering soldiers who are in the triumph, in the procession, with our general, our captain, as Hebrews calls the Lord Jesus. So, I don't think it's a case of, well, uh, are we the, uh, the captives, or are we the, the conquering soldiers in glory? It is what I would call a kaleidoscope of images, that the image of defeat, the image of loss, the image of humiliation is merged into the image of the triumphant victor. Yes, we are both. We are led in that triumph behind the Lord Jesus, the wonderful general who won the battle, won the campaign. And I often talk about this when we're chatting about Revelation, that this idea of a kaleidoscope of images where you have one image, in this case of the, uh, let's say, the, the defeated soldier who is being led out to death, and the kaleidoscope turns and it becomes the image of the glorious conquering soldier who has won and is now enjoying his moment of glory. And this is his whole theme that he's developing now in the next chapters, particularly picks it up here in chapter 4, that things are not what they seem. You see that particularly with the Lord's death, but there, naked, covered in blood and spittle, he appeared to be the ultimate loser. Come down from the cross now and we will believe. Nothing happened. Dead. Is he dead? He's dead. Right. He's a loser. He lost. He had a good run, but he lost. And yet, in the eyes of God, when he was lifted up on the stake, he was lifted up in glory, in God's eyes. And it was through his death, as you see from the vision in Revelation 5, it was through his death that he attained this amazing glory, the greatest glory that has ever been given to anyone, given to the Lord Jesus, because of his death. So his death was a triumph, was a victory. And so, as I say, it's the kaleidoscope of images. And he's asking the Corinthians and asking us to see that life is not what it seems. That the loser is not the loser, but is the, the winner the, in glory. And I'm sure we've all seen that. The, some of the most spiritually minded people that we know are often people who have been totally humiliated by whatever, People who lost, maybe lost their wealth, lost their health, lost their image, lost their standing. But 
false accusation, or true accusation, actual failure, thought up failure, whatever. Through all that, they become very spiritual people. And so what in the eyes of man is failure? That you lost your house because it burnt down, you weren't insured. You lost your career. You were falsely accused of something at work and so you were struck off the list and you can't practice anymore. So now you're just trying to scrape a bit of money together to buy food, being a taxi driver or whatever. And <clears throat> this is actually glory in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of man. Sure, like the crucified body of Jesus was the ultimate loss in their eyes, but it was glory in God's eyes. And that is one reason why life often doesn't work out. That you don't get the success and the glory in this life that actually you should do. According to someone of your level of intelligence, of, of your level of being a hard worker, you should have done better. Something stopped you. Yeah. And something that wasn't your fault. And yeah, that's right. You, you might have been the good husband and your wife was a party girl. And you know, eventually she divorced you, and she cleaned you out, falsely accused you, got the kids, got your money, got the house, whatever way around it is. And it all seems so unfair. Yeah, and in the eyes of society, in the court of public opinion, you are a loser. All right. But in the eyes of God, quite the other way around. The old brother who I used to tramp up he lived in a pretty etage, and there's five, uh, five level, five-story uh, apartment blocks that are very common here in the Soviet Union. No lifts in the five, five-story ones. So you go and see an old, I say an old man, he's 70, I suppose, dying of lung cancer. His wife left him when uh, he was diagnosed, and he was, no one would take him any food, no one cared for him. And the flat stunk, he could hardly look after himself. Nurses didn't really make much effort with him. And there, in what appeared to be a pathetic situation of a man forgotten by the guys he used to work with in the factory, by his wife and his daughter, neighbours weren't really bothered either, there was a man who absolutely had the mind of Christ for all that. And when he died, that was glory. His next waking moment will be the kingdom. That's for sure. So what in the eyes of man is despised, is glorious in God's eyes. And this is what Paul's trying to say. You're saying that I should be more humanly impressive, that I should have a better sort of image with you, and I should be a better speaker, and I should be this, and I should be that. Look, that's not how it goes. Life is not what it seems. Look at it with other eyes. And this whole thing of the Roman triumph, there you are, the bedraggled, defeated, surrendered, beaten prisoner being led out to death. Yeah. But the kaleidoscope turns if you have the eye of faith and you are more than a conqueror for him that loved you. And... I wonder if actually he keeps talking about this Roman triumph and alluding to it, as we'll see in chapter 4 and in other, other places, because he knew what was going to happen, that Jerusalem was going to fall. And you read Josephus, great big long descriptions of the Roman triumph in Rome at the end of the Jewish war, when the Jews had been totally defeated and Jerusalem had been, uh, had been destroyed and, and the temple burnt and, and so on. As if he's saying in advance, yeah, when that happens, don't worry. Don't see it as the eye, through the eyes of unbelieving, non-Christian Jews. See it actually as all part of the development of God's glory. So, you, you come here to chapter 4, and he says, verse 7, We have this treasure in earthly vessels. In vessels made of clay. Well, quite a few of the commentators say, ah, oh, that's an allusion uh, to the Roman triumph, where the defeated soldiers had to carry the booty, as it were, their own valuable treasures, their crowns and things like that, on these, th th these earthen vessels. 
to absolutely humiliate them. And I think that is what he does have in view, because he goes on then, in verse 11, to specifically allude again to the triumph, the Roman triumph. For we who live are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake. So we are being taken to death. We are being handed over to death. And that's why the Roman triumph was also called, for these prisoners, the march to the scaffold. It was a march to the scaffold. The very opposite of glory. And, of course, it fits very much with the Lord's message to us that he was taking his cross and walking as a criminal on his last walk to the place of crucifixion. And he says, and you are to take up your cross and walk after me. The same basic principle here, that we are led out to death. The march to the scaffold. And yet, as I say, the kaleidoscope moves and it's an image of glory. That through death, there comes this glory. Through loss, through defeat, through surrender, there comes the ultimate glory of victory because of him who loved us. And you know, elsewhere in Corinthians he says, God has set forth us the apostles last of all, despised of all the most. And again, it's the language of the the triumph that we, the apostles, we are like the most humiliated of all the prisoners who are being led out to death in the triumph. And so <clears throat> he says, we who live, verse 11, are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake. This triumph that we're in goes on always. And this is the same word that he's got in chapter 2 when he says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. This is a way of life. This is not just a couple of uh, negative moments that push you down in the course of your life. This is the spirit of life, always like this. And so in the drudgery of daily life, if you wish to look at the glass half full, made up of whatever goes on, child care, developing in your job, earning money, coming home, going back, doing the same, the whole thing goes on. But in that apparently endless trudgery, we are always being led in the triumph. Always. This is a way of life. Well then, he, goes, he, he, has, uh, he said we have this treasure in earthen vessels, yet we're carrying the best that we have to give it to, to our conqueror. But the exceeding greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted on every side, yet not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, pursued, captured, chased after, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Now, Corinth was where the Isthmian games were played as like second after the Olympic Games. And so there's a lot of allusion here to gladiatorship and to people and to wrestling, I think. I think the idea is that you are caught by the opposing wrestler on every side, but he doesn't crush you as he normally would. We are perplexed. We don't know how to respond. We're outwitted, but not in despair. We are chased after in the Olympic race and overtaken, but we're not forsaken. We are struck down, which is again is a wrestling term, but not destroyed. We are beaten, but then we are not beaten. That is the idea. But I think, although there is the allusion to all that in the games, etc., I think this is also all military language. The language of men fighting who lost. We're hemmed in on every side. Yep. That's it, guys. We're surrounded. We're lost. But not crushed. We are perplexed. We are outwitted by the enemy. They won, but not in despair. We are pursued. We are chased after and overtaken. You know, the image is being chased and the chaser gets a lead on you closer and closer until he's got you. But not forsaken. We are struck down to the ground, 
but not destroyed. This is the great paradox. This is what we said earlier, writing from Frederick Buchner, the magnificent defeat. The magnificent defeat. This is what happened to the Lord Jesus. And this is what happens with us. And he says, verse 10, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our body, because we who live are always, again this word always, it's a way of life, are always being delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So I don't think this is only talking about death and resurrection. The idea is that we die with him daily. I die daily, Paul says. And his resurrection life through the Spirit comes new in us. And so life is, if you like, a, a whole train of events where you lose, where you are beaten, where you are killed. And you, yet you live with him. Because his life is manifest, he says, in our mortal flesh. He always leads us. We're always being led in the triumph, as captive prisoners were led. This word always keeps cropping up. <clears throat> we are always, verse 11, being delivered to death for Jesus' sake. Well, <clears throat> and... Uh, the whole idea then is that this is a way of life. The passion and the intensity of the triumph, being led in the Roman triumph, this characterizes our lives. It's why, if you want to look at it, the glass half full, life is a series of mess ups and, oh, this happened, oh, and that happened. For the unbeliever, this is incredibly frustrating. It's why people live very frustrated lives. This didn't work out properly, and that didn't work out properly. And Oh, we paid for that to be done, for the roof to be fixed, but they didn't do it properly. And, oh, this happened. And, oh, now the computer's broken down. And, oh, the, uh, I don't know, my phone fell off the table and smashed, on the, smashed the screen on the floor. Ah, oh, this happened, that happened. Yeah, it's all very negative. And they're frustrated because they have no perspective. Whereas for us, yeah, this happens. This is life. A, a, a train of these events all, all the way through. But each of them enables the life of Jesus to be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That's where you have to understand that to be a Christian is to have the spirit or the mind or the life of Christ. We take this cup of wine to symbolize that, that I want his life in me. Not just his death in his body, but his, in the bread, but his life also coming through into my life all the time. And so he says <clears throat> in verse 11 that we are always being delivered to death. And verse 12, so then death works in us and life in you. Death works in us. Death, then, is not the final, you lost, game over card. Death works. And he's going to say, later on in verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Here he says, death works. There, 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us this far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You can't come to life unless you die. That's the idea. You, the path to life is through death, is through loss, is through surrender, is through being beaten. And so, <clears throat> death works. Whereas, when all is said and done, for everybody who is not a true, committed believer in Jesus Christ, death is the final fear. That is the thing that is inevitable and your wealth, your acumen, your smartness, your career, your family, all the things that you build up in your life <clears throat> cannot get you out of that and you know it. Whereas for us, a death works. We see death not as the end but as a bridge, as something to be crossed, as something necessary. And he's going to conclude by saying, although our outward man 
perishes. It's going downhill. The inward, the inward man is renewed day by day. So, we have a totally different perspective on death. Psychologists, some of them more honest ones, looked into people's dreams, into people's fears. Fears of being boxed in, of walls that are too high to climb. And there's a big, big unconscious fear of death. That's recognised in Hebrews, where we're told that the Lord Jesus has delivered us, who all our lifetime were subject to bondage, the fear of death. That, therefore, is what keeps man in bondage, <clears throat> the fear of death. But that is dealt with if you are confident, by God's grace, that I will live forever. His life is already being manifested in me. Sure, my outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being made new, and I have that life already in me. And in verse 12, he also says something at first blush rather curious. So then death works in us. I think he means me and Timothy, we who have been preaching to you. Death works in us, but life in you. I think he's saying that through our suffering, we can give life to other people. Through our death, you not only get life for yourself, but for others. And so <clears throat> that, again, is an example of where the very spirit of Jesus is lived out by us. His death on the cross is not an icon to be looked at from afar, but it is a pattern to be followed. He died that we might have life. And sure, he died so that he might have life, but so that we might have life. That is the emphasis of the scriptures. And death then works in us, but life in you through our daily irritations, loss, death, and having the life of Jesus bursting forward and through in us, I give you that life. And that is the only life that is worth living, actually, when it is giving life to others. It is why the most significant thing most human beings ever do is to reproduce, is to give life to, to a child, to another human being. But on a spiritual level, I mean, this is why we must witness and bring men and women, to, and boys and girls, to know that eternal life. Because that is what makes sense of all your sufferings. If you just lock yourself in your apartment and, and suffer all your things, and you don't reach out and give anything to it, give life to anybody else. I don't mean material help, I mean the life that is in Jesus Christ. The life that is in the Gospel. Yes, specifically, actually, to the point, witnessing to people. Not just doing good deeds, but actually giving people the actual, concrete, good news of eternal life that is in Jesus Christ. If you don't do that, well, all your deaths, all your losses, are so much the harder to deal with. Yeah, Paul says death works in us, so that you might have life. And, as I say, verse 16 Though our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. Well, this idea of renewing, of regeneration, is very common. Titus 3 talks about the laver, where they used to wash before they made the sacrifices in the tabernacle, the laver of renewing or regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Romans 12, renewed in the spirit of our mind. Colossians 3, we have put on the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge and relationship after the image of its creator. So there is the gift of the spirit. I do not mean rabbits out of hats, speaking in tongues, the miraculous stuff. But the gift of his mind, his life, if you are more comfortable with that term other than spirit, his life in me renewing me. We are renewed. And by the way, that is different, isn't it, to creation, sort of ex nihilo, out of nothing. Who we are as persons shall remain. Salvation is personal. But the good news is of personal renewing, of regeneration. This is the difference between building a house from scratch and 
renovating, renovating, making new an existing property. And, and that is the idea that all things shall be made new, shall be renewed, not scribbled. It's not nirvana, whereby we totally don't exist. We shall be renewed. I personally, you personally, we will be saved. You, me, it's the sum of all our experiences in this life and moulding of personality, etc. We shall be changed, sure, 1 Corinthians 15, but the essential you and me will be saved, will be renewed. The spirit will be saved in the day of judgment, Paul has earlier said in, uh, in Corinthians. So then, this is what is happening, and, and this gives, I think, a special meaning to middle age and old age, where in secular terms, it's all going down. You feel in your own body your outward man perishing, and you are effectively sidelined and sidetracked because of your age. And eventually, there's this mentality of retirement, that I am now retired. Whereas this whole idea that we're running a race to the end, you do not retire from that race. In fact, it heats up towards the end in spiritual terms. We are renewed day by day inside us. And what happens in the inner man is the work of the Spirit. Strengthened, Ephesians 3.16, strengthened with might by his power, by his Spirit in the inner man. We are made new, although the outward man is perishing. We are made new, like my dear friend who is dying there of cancer, up the top of a tower block with no block of flats with no stair, with no, no, no lift. Made new, renewed in the spirit of his mind, after the image of Jesus who was creating him. And this is true for you and me, all the way through. If this is the focus of our lives, so he says, verse 17, our slight momentary affliction accomplishes for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. I'm sure when we're in the kingdom, we'll look back on this life and it will seem so bizarre that this is like one millimeter. How many years you cough and hack your way through in this world, 70, 80, 90 years, this is all just a millimeter compared to the eternal long line without any end of God's kingdom. And we'll look back and think, that, that, that was bizarre. That I am here rejoicing in eternity for the sake of oh, that stuff back then. And I didn't do very well in it either. I was very weak in my faith and my understanding and my love and my commitment. Just for that, I'm here. There is no comparison. There is, it is not a worthy to be compared. But it depends, of course, how you look at it. Our slight momentary affliction. The person who does not have faith in the kingdom of God or who believes in God but doesn't believe in personal salvation will say, but since when? If somebody is stuck on their back with a terrible degenerative disease, if somebody is in a terrible personal domestic relationship that is just nothing but grief from the minute they wake up and the minute they go to sleep at night. Day in, day out. No let up at all. Since the, when is that just a slight momentary of affliction? Well, it depends on your perspective. If this life is all you've got, well, sure, every, every second drags, sure. But if you are convinced that you have the hope, and the hope, elpis, means not hope for the best, but the absolute certainty. If you have before you the absolute certainty of eternity, that I know if Jesus comes now, or I die now, I will definitely, by his grace alone, because of his cross, because of his love for me, I will definitely be there. I have got eternal life absolutely in front of me. Sure, we we'll chuck it all away tomorrow, but at this minute, I know that I will live forever. Wow. Well, all this stuff is just a moment. But if you don't have that certainty, well, yeah, you are just going to look at what's immediately in front of your nose, 
oh, this is painful, this is bad, this is bad luck, this is a bad situation I'm in. Yeah. Because you don't have that perspective. All you've got is this life. All you've got is the idea, well, I've only got 70, 80 years max. Uh, the last bit of it's probably not great anyway. Um, you know, and I, I haven't got there. I'm whatever, 55 years old, and I don't own my own flat, or don't I have a decent car, or whatever it is. Um, well, you know, yes. If this life is all you've got, well, sure, you better get your skates on, or you lost it. I'm afraid didn't do too well, did you, in the game? But that's all rubbish. That's all irrelevant. When you understand that this is a momentary, just for a moment of time, that is all we are here for. That life is so short. It is tragically short. It is a moment. That is what he's saying. But when you look at how he uses that word affliction or tribulation, it's also translated, the New Testament and Paul himself fully recognises that the affliction or the tribulation that we go through now, although it is only for a moment, is very painful. I'll give you a few examples of where that word is used. Um, it, to the Thessalonians, he says, much affliction. You've been through, I've been through, much affliction. He fully gives due weight to the pain of the immediate. Through much tribulation, same word, affliction. Through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom. Much, lots of it. All your tribulations which you endure, he writes again to the Thessalonians. Well, here to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, out of much tribulation we wrote to you. 2 Corinthians 1, all our tribulation that we went through in Asia, insomuch that we despaired even of life itself. And yet he says here that affliction is oh, very light. No, it's just for a moment. But I'm saying that he does not downplay the weight of the immediate moment. And neither does the Lord Jesus. When you come to the book of Revelation, you've got the same term used, affliction or tribulation. I know your tribulation, he says to one of the churches. I know. I do realize what you're going through. The faithful are brought out of great tribulation. The greatness of the tribulation, the affliction, is recognized. That is what I'm saying. And yet, his argument here is that ah, it's very light, because it's only for a moment. Yeah, and the Lord himself is alluding, surely, to the Lord's words, where he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So uh, how come? Well, yeah. In, he explains here, I think, what the Lord was really getting at. It is light and it is easy in comparison. I mean, affliction, suffering, is to some degree, uh, some degree sort of relevant to the perspective in which you understand it. And here he is playing on the idea of time, that this is only for a moment. It's a light affliction. That works for us, the eternal weight of glory. That which is for the moment works something eternal. Death itself works in us. And so, as I say, you can only take comfort from all this if you are assured that in front of you there is eternity. If you say, oh, Judgment Day, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I've not been a great guy, I'm afraid. I, I, I'm not a big time sinner, but I'm, yeah, I'm not, I don't know how that's going to work out. That's what I'm told. Right. Pop this hard question to people. Do you believe if Jesus comes now, or if you die now from a heart attack, do you believe you're going to be saved? Or, or, oh, I don't know. You see, you don't realise, Duncan, I, 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 I've got some problems in my life. And I, well, I do believe, but, but you see. All this and blah, blah. Look, the good news of the kingdom of God is not good news about this kingdom, if physical information, or if you like, about what it's going to be like. The good news is that you and I are going to be there. And anything less than that, you've trashed the gospel. You've taken the good news out of the gospel. The good news, the wonderful news, is that we will be there. And once you've got that, wow, wow, that, that transforms your life. I'm telling you, it transforms your life. 
that this life is nothing, that this is a, a moment. The whole thing is just a moment, momentary. And what you're going through might seem awful, but it's compared to that, it's nothing, it's light. Now, as I say, that, as I said, this is not to downgrade or to renegotiate the, the real pain of what we go through. And I've said that Paul himself recognises this, that he talks about much tribulation, much affliction, much anguish. Only through that will you enter the kingdom. But then here he says, yeah, but it's, it's very light, really, in comparison to that eternity and the weight of glory that is ahead. And so he winds up in 18 by saying that we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, just for a moment. For the things which are not seen are eternal. Well, our Father, the Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount, sees in secret. He has this way of looking at things which are not as though they are. Romans. And we are asked to look with the same eyes of the Spirit that he has. That means that we are seeing a world, we are seeing a universe, physically and also in terms of ideas, which the world doesn't see. It's like we're walking around this world seeing things that they don't see. Because we see that everything is temporal. They look at a, a beautiful new car and want to have a selfie taken next to the brand new car, you know, to show off, put it on social media. We look at that differently. Oh, what's that lump of metal that's just here for, for a nanosecond in, in the context of eternity? What are you looking at? Rubbish. Uh, not for me. I'm not interested. I'm looking somewhere else. Uh, you know, we look at all these things differently very differently, with a totally new pair of eyes. This is why the Lord says a number of times in, in his teaching that the world sees but they don't see. Whereas our eyes are opened and we see. This is a very common metaphor, that we see what they don't see. So you're walking through this life, looking at everything differently. Oh, you lost your job. Oh, you got struck off. Uh, on some professional body and you can't practice your career anymore. Oh, the eyes of the world, that, 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 that's awful. That's game over. That's terrible. Let's turn to alcohol. Let's do drugs. Let's commit suicide. Let's give up. Well, look at that. Oh, yeah. Here's another blow on, on, the, on the anvil. Here, here is another death with Jesus. Okay, sure. Uh, so that his life will be manifest in me. Yep, this is another town along the road, closer and closer. To that wonderful kingdom. And when he says that the things which are seen are temporal, temporal. It's the same word in Hebrews 11 where it talks about Moses, how he saw correctly. And he left Egypt because he did not want to enjoy what the King James calls the pleasures of sin for a season. And for a season is the same word here as temporal. The pleasures of sin for a season. Oh yeah, we went to uh, this holiday place and we had a fantastic time. Oh, it was brilliant, you know. There was this and there was that. and Got these cheap drugs and this sort of conversation you overhear on aeroplanes, people coming back from the holidays and oh yeah, and their pizza was really nice and there were these nice girls and there were these nice fellas and all that stuff. Pleasures of sin for a season. This is temporal. This is just passing away. Now, we have got a totally new pair of eyes. We who are renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created us. Anoint your eyes, Jesus says, with ointment that you might see so that you see differently, so that you understand life differently. You just look at everything differently. And it is really as if you're walking around in a world where the lights are turned out and everyone else is stumbling around and you, you see where you're going. They don't know where they're going. Yeah? They're walking in darkness. Whereas we have got the light. And sure, as John says, the darkness is passing away and the true light shines. In other words, yeah, we're not out of the darkness yet. It's still clouded 
by the way they see things. But it's getting clearer, and I think it does get clearer as you mature spiritually, that this is all just passing away, that this is for a moment. But as I say, you will only get that final perspective clear in your, in your mind once you are sure that in front of me is eternity. Not eternity for maybe some people, but for me, I don't know. No, once you yourself are sure of that, that my eternity is secure, that I am secure in his love, sinner that I am, weak as I am, but I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Then, sure, the whole argument here that all this stuff is for a moment, temporal, momentary, these words that he uses, yeah, then that becomes true for, for you. That this is just a moment. And what is all this anyway? You cannot take it with you. And the suffering is for a moment. And we look at the things that are eternal. Well, come back to how I started, that Paul is using all these arguments, he's deploying them against the pettiness of these Corinthians, that are you this, or you that, or you, you should dress yourself better when you give a talk, or you should, you've got a speech impediment, you're not a very impressive speaker, or whatever they were saying to him, or you're fickle, you keep changing your travel plans, and, Oh, you're this, you, you're that, you're trying to get money out of it. So, so you say, but look, overarching all that is these more wonderful things. So whatever are the petty niggles in your life, and life is full of all that stuff, that's life in this world. Overarching all that is this far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory because of what he did. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the Lord Jesus. And we eagerly take this bread as the communion of the body of Christ, wanting to be in his body, wanting the whole thing to be true for us as it was for him. Willing, Father, to die, willing to give, willing to give up. Prepared, Father, for you to take everything from us, including life itself that we might live with him forevermore and also have his life manifest now in our mortal flesh. Heavenly Father, hasten the day when at last faith shall be turned to sight and this invisible world of your glory that we see will be turned to sight for his sake. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this cup in which we see in this wine the symbol of the blood of Jesus, his life, which we pray will be manifested in our mortal flesh day by day now, as we die daily with him and have his life daily, day by day, made new in us. We pray, Father, that this might be the absolute focus of our hearts, of our living, of our understanding of the whole world. And we pray, Father, truly, that we might see this world through your eyes, through his eyes, and look through all this to that which is to come, to that far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that he attained for us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But all things are of God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors on behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating the world by us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 